I'm delighted to be part of this. Uh, so I'm a little short on one end, so I'm going to move this thing down. It's, I'm delighted to be part of this symposium uh, on the 75th anniversary of the analytical division of the ECS. Is this working? I guess it isn't. Is it? Okay. Um, the title of my talk, as Dennis indicated, is, of course, uh, concentrating on spectrochemical analysis. And uh, the problem here that I faced is what all the other speakers in this symposium faced. Seventy-five years is a long time to cover in 40 minutes, so we have to use different approaches. Uh, Graham used the, uh, the approach of looking at uh, different ion sources, different developments in mass spectrometry. Uh, Bill Heinemann concentrated on electrodes. I'm going to use a slightly different uh, uh, approach in this, but first of all, set down some boundary conditions. First of all, I'll work only with uh, things involving electromagnetic radiation. Notice the size of the cursor. This is... <laughs> <laughs> From Indiana University, that cursor comes. So I'll talk only about developments that involve electromagnetic radiation. That is, I won't concentrate on mass spectrometry because Graham Cooks has already concentrated on that. Uh, the spectral region, uh, I haven't isolated uh, in particular anything from the radio frequency region to the gamma ray region. Any topic that means we could talk about methods or theory or instrumentation, any field that is chemistry, physics, engineering, whatever it happens to be. I do want to emphasize U.S. developments because we're talking about the analytical division of the American Chemical Society. So with a few exceptions, with only a few exceptions, I'll talk only about U.S. developments. I also want to talk about things that have a proven impact, and of course that discriminates against the recent developments because their impact is not yet clear. And of course I want to concentrate on developments that happened since 1938. Now that last limitation is not terribly serious because in 1938 there really wasn't much that was done in spectrochemical analysis. And to give you some perspective, I've gotten a, a photograph. This is really a 1938 photograph of a pharmaceutical laboratory. It really was an analytical laboratory. But one of the things you, you notice if you look around at all these different uh, pieces of equipment and that sort of thing is that there are no instruments, <laughs> no instruments at all. And in fact, if you go to the instrument room in those days, what you'd probably find is this, the old Dubas colorimeter which was developed about 1870. Uh, I actually uh, was a lab technician for a number of years when I was in college, at Hope College, and I used one of these things. So it's still in, in use in the 1960s when I went to college. And of course it takes advantage of Beer's Law. We have uh, two different uh, cells here, one of which is a reference, one of which is a sample. And just by changing the depth uh, of, of these uh, little plungers, you can compare the, uh, the two samples, one the, the standard, one the sample. And by that uh, difference in, in uh, path length, you can get the concentration of the unknown. And uh, one of the things I'll do in this, in this talk is to emphasize people. And there'll be a couple of instances where I give you quotes. And the quotes are a little dubious, as you'll see. Some of you, the older people in the audience, will rem remember Ralph Mueller. Uh, Ralph Mueller had a column in Analytical Chemistry. And before that, in the predecessor of the journal Analytical Chemistry, which was Industrial and Engineering Chemistry Analytical Edition. He wrote this column for many, many years. The column was excellent. It had to do with instrumentation. And in 1938, he, or 1939, rather, he said this. For colorimetric chemical analysis, the visual Dubas colorimeter is still the most versatile and useful instrument. It probably was in 1939. Two years later, he extrapolated, and he said, the assumption that any photoelectric instrument must be more accurate and reliable than a visual instrument is wholly unwarranted. Well, I th <laughs> think that might have been disproven, but he had a lot of other uh, predictions that were, in fact, true. So again, going back to the problems in organizing and delivering a lecture like this, let me just summarize them. First of all, as I said, there's only 40 minutes, 75 years to cover it. Another danger is that I'll omit someone's favorite topics. So my solution was the same as David Letterman. <laughs> I'm going to pick the, uh, the top ten. And in order to do that, I consulted a, a whole bunch of people. I won't bother going into uh, all these different people and what they contributed. But they're people who have a broad range of backgrounds and different aspects of generally analytical chemistry, but in particular spectrochemical analysis. And some people, such as Dick Zeri, might identify more with physical chemistry. But they all had something to contribute, and they wound up giving me this long list of topics. <laughs> And this is actually an abbreviated list. Well, there's no way I can cover all of these, so I basically let the people vote on those things, and then I added my own weighting factors and came up with, <laughs> <laughs> came up with a top ten. And these are the top ten. And what I'm going to do for the rest of this presentation is to go through that top ten, 
give you some information about the different topics and in part what role they played in analytical chemistry and in the, the development of analytical chemistry, keeping in mind that I'm going to concentrate on the last 75 years, the years since 1938. So first of all, the laser, which was in fact number one. The laser um, has a number of properties, of course, that make it extremely attractive as a source for spectrochemical analysis. But when I started uh, in spectroscopy back in, uh, at the University of Illinois in 1965, uh, the laser uh, was barely even on the, uh, on the scene. And for many, many years, at least 10 years, the laser was, was said to be a solution looking for a problem. But of course, that all has changed now. The laser has a number of properties, as I indicated, that make it extremely valuable at least potentially valuable as a source for spectro spectrochemical analysis. First of all, it's spatially coherent. What that means is that we can deliver the light to the sample or to the standard, whatever we wish. And that means we can do a lot of things with the laser power itself. Small spot focus means that we can use a laser to do uh, microanalysis. Not quite nanoanalysis, but certainly down to the micrometer level. High power, that means that we can ablate samples, we can do a lot of things that involve nonlinear effects of, of uh, optics and radiation. Monochromaticity means that we can get spectral resolution in the, uh, in the regions that can be accessed with a laser that was unprecedented. The laser can be highly polarized, and that means we can do a number of things that involve, for example, looking at optical rotation and other aspects. Adjustable waveform, we can have a laser that has a really, really short pulse. It can be sinusoidally modulated, modulated in a square wave fashion. It has phase coherence. That's what allows us to do holography and a lot of other nonlinear optical methods. Tunability, well, that's not quite as good as we'd like. We'd like to have a laser that's tunable from the radio frequency region to the gamma ray region. We're lucky if we get a few hundred nanometers out of a typical laser before we have to change to something else. But there is some aspect of tunability in the laser. And as I said, the waveform is completely adjustable, so we can have laser pulses that are actually sub-femtosecond now really, really short pulses, allowing us to look at the, the intricate movements and, and uh, interactions of, of molecular and atomic species. Now, the use of lasers in commercial instrumentation really is relatively recent. This is a laundry list of the different uh, methods, commercial instruments, that in fact use lasers in, in one way or another. Raman spectroscopy is obvious. Without the laser, Raman spectroscopy would still be a laboratory curiosity. Laser ablation, MALDI, uh, Graham indicated that I might mention something about uh, the use of lasers in mass spectrometry. That's about the only thing I'll, I'll mention here. But matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization is certainly a very important method. Laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, LIBS, fiber optic sensors, diode laser-based atomic absorption and atomic fluorescence spectrometry, high-resolution spectrometry, LIDAR, which stands for light detection and raging. It's, at a first approximation, it's what the cops use to track you now with your, with your laser system. And if you have the right kind of laser system, you can defeat them too. <laughs> In fact, I want to tell you a little side story here. I might not get through all my slides, but I have to tell you some anecdotes. There's a guy in the audience named Bonner Denton sitting over here. And Bonner had, uh, had a way that he proposed uh, to overcome, at that time, the microwave uh, radar systems. It turns out that if you have an incoming laser beam or a, a microwave beam, you can actually mix that. You can heterodyne it with a local oscillator and send another beam back that's far, far stronger than the reflected beam from the radar gun. And what you do is you set this local oscillator to 50.5 miles an hour or something like that, and <laughs> you can completely defeat the system. It's illegal, but I think Bonner has one in every one of his cars. <laughs> Then, of course, there's atomic force microscopy. A lot of uh, the, uh, the atom-level microscopic methods use a laser just as, as a feedback device. Particle size measurement, fiber optic links, CD readers. Of course, there are CD readers in a lot of instruments, barcode readers, uh, laser printers, and diode laser absorption. Tell you a little bit about the development of the laser. It was de uh, developed uh, back really in 1958 by Charles Towns and Arthur Shullow. This is a photograph of, of Towns quite some time ago, but he is still alive, as you can see from from the label here. In 1958, he and uh, Art, Art Shallow produced a, a publication called Infrared and Optical Masers. Uh, maser stands for microwave, uh, uh, microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And uh, the optical maser then was changed in name to, to laser later on. In 1960, he and Shallow got the patent for the laser. And here's an interesting thing. In 1964, Charles Towns got the Nobel Prize in Physics. If we look at Art Shallow, he didn't get his Nobel Prize until 1981 for a slightly different uh, aspect of the same thing, yet they had the same development. 
Here's a photograph of the front page of the laser patent, and uh, here's the way the laser looked. They were using, at that time, a ruby laser. In fact, I'll mention Bonner again. Bonner used a ruby laser in his graduate work at the University of Illinois. I think it was the same one that Shalo and Towns used. Isn't it the same one, Bonner? I think so. <laughs> but the amazing thing is that the design of the relatively modern lasers, the neodymium YAG laser and the ruby laser that we can still buy, is very much like this. The designs are really quite similar. Some early laser applications. The first commercial device, does anyone want to, uh, want to suggest perhaps what the first commercial use of a laser would be? It was by Arthur Shallow. He patented this. Any suggestions, any ideas, any guesses? It was an eraser. <laughs> Shallow actually patented and tried to market a laser eraser. Of course, the black ink from the typewriter would absorb the laser radiation and be volatilized, whereas the white paper would just reflect it. Now, there were some problems because the lasers in those days were room-filling room things. <laughs> and, of course, the, uh, the reflection from the white paper wasn't very good for someone's eyes. So it never was a commercial success. How about the first analytical application? This is really going to surprise some of the people in the audience who are atomic spectrometrists. What do you think it might be? Keep in mind, go back here a couple of... Thanks here. The laser patent was in 1960. So what was this first analytical application? It was LIBS, Laser Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy. Fred Breck published a paper in Applied Spectroscopy in 1962, two years after the laser was invented, in which he used the laser to ablate a sample simultaneously with the same laser to excite the atoms that are volatilized in the sample and use that then for analytical purposes. And LIBS in the last uh, 10 years or so has undergone a, a real resurgence in interest. How about the first publication in analytical chemistry that used the laser? Anyone want to guess there? This is bizarre. What? Nothing? Just to open a, a can, actually. <laughs> this, this paper was, <laughs> this is a, a, a canister that, that held a, a sample. It was enclosed in an evacuated container because it was quite hazardous, and the laser was then used to punch a hole in the side of the canister so it could be analyzed. Amazing stuff, 1965. Okay, let's then turn to single molecule detection. And here I want to introduce someone, uh, as we've seen in a couple of, uh, in the last two talks, as a matter of fact, some people seem to pay, play an enormous part in the development of a particular area of analytical chemistry. This is Thomas Hirschfeld. He died at the age of, very young age of, of 46. Tremendous guy. Uh, he was a, a good friend, a colleague. We had a number of publications together. But Thomas had an interesting way of, of looking at things. Um, he was the first person ever to detect a single molecule. And in fact, you can see the spikes here. These are, these are spikes. From, oh, that's a nice cursor. I love that. These, these spikes are for individual molecules that have to be drifting in and out of, the, uh, out of the beam. But the trick, the cheat perhaps, is this. He had between 80 and 100 molecules of fluorescein isothionate that were bound to a single molecule of something else. He was looking at this single molecule, but there are a whole bunch of fluorophores. And in fact, he found that he got about uh, a million or so photons per reagent molecule before the reagent molecules, it is the, the fluorescein thios, isothiocyanate, finally uh, photochemically degraded. But it was still single molecule detection. Now, since that time, a lot of other people have uh, gotten into this field and developed all kinds of new techniques. Uh, Dick Keller at Los Alamos used hydrodynamic focusing. Myrner uh, did uh, trapping of molecules and pores. The big problem here, of course, in detecting single molecules is getting rid of the background. So however you want to get rid of the background, uh, and there are a lot of ways of doing it, you might be able to do single mo molecule detection. An example is Ed Young's work in evanescent wave excitation. If you have an ev evanescent wave that looks just a short distance into a, into a solution from a prism, of course the background is greatly reduced. The background from other things fluorescing, from Raman spectroscopy, that sort of thing. Uh, surface enhanced resonance Raman, of course, is another way of boosting the signal. and con Excuse me, Katrina Knipe and uh, Shuming Ni did that. Uh, more recently, tip enhanced Raman spectrometry became available. Renato Zanobi and Volker Deckert were involved in that. And there are a lot of other ways now of, of looking at single molecule detection. Next, single atom detection. Strangely enough, this happened about the same time. It wasn't any easier, or in fact, it was actually somewhat harder to do single molecule, or single atom detection than single molecule detection. And that's that fluorescence can't easily be used. If you think about gaseous atoms, atoms in the gas phase, what happens is the atoms to a first approximation give you the same wavelength back in fluorescence. It's called resonance fluorescence, as of course you use for the excitation beam. 
unless you use some indirect kind of fluorescence, you have a really serious background problem. So the first way of measuring um, single atoms was by Hearst, Nafe, and, and Young. Jack Young, by the way, was a graduate of Indiana University. I want to point that out. He's the guy with the big cursor right here. <laughs> and the way in which they did this was uh, using resonance ionization spectroscopy, that is, excitation of the desired atom. These were actually cesium atoms took place, and then those cesium atoms could be ionized. And the way in which this uh, was amplified was the same way in which a Geiger-Muller counter uh, is used. That is, the cell that contained the, uh, the cesium atoms had in it some P10 gas. And this P10 gas is 90% argon, 10% methane. And what happens is when a cesium atom was produced, or a cesium ion, rather, was produced, the electron went to a positive electrode, the positive ion moved to a negative electrode, and those species, as they're traveling, collided with the, uh, the methane gas and caused cascade ionization. So an enormous ionization process took place and that produced a, a click in a Geiger counter. In this case, it just produced a cascade ionization that produced a pulse. But they were able to measure single atoms in that way. And since that time, a lot of other methods have been developed. This is back in 1976, sorry. A lot of other methods have been developed and I urge you, if you're interested in this topic, to go back to this, this paper by Case Alcamont. Again, one of the the really brilliant people in, in spectroscopy. This paper in 1981 in applied spectroscopy really sets the stage for single atom detection. The difficulties that would be involved, the possibilities that exist, how to reduce the background, how to do single atom detection, and so on. Case Alcamont, again, was a, a brilliant, brilliant guy. He uh, was at the University of uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands in the physics department. Again, 1981. A big thing that took place mostly in America, not exclusively, but mostly in America, that was extremely important in spectrochemical analysis is the, the development of better and better diffraction gratings. And we can go way back to Roland. This, is, this predates, of course, the analytical division. Roland died in 1901. He was the first physics professor, it turns out, at Johns Hopkins University. And while he was there, he invented the, a really precise ruling engine for making gratings. And uh, he also developed the concept of curve gratings. In fact, he developed whole spectrometer approaches that are based on what is now called the Roland circle. By having a curve grating, you can have a bunch of, of different exit slits or exit regions where spectra, in fact, are, are then displayed. But that was before 1938. But if we go a little bit farther in the future, there's another American, George Harrison, the different George Harrison, not the same one of Beatles fame. He was at MIT, again, in the physics department. And he developed, uh, he improved on Roland's ruling engine. These are uh, engines that were interferometrically controlled. That is, the wavelength of light was what controlled the spacing on the gratings, so that the gratings became much, much more precise. And uh, ruling errors, as they're called, periodic ruling errors, were not quite as serious. They still existed, but they weren't quite as serious. Harrison also did an enormous number of spectral measurements. He assigned wavelengths to most elements in the periodic table. Uh, resulting in what are called, and still used, the MIT wavelength tables. I think that any practicing atomic spectrometrist will have a, a copy of the volumes of the MIT wavelength tables. Um, Harrison also developed a thing called the Ischel spectrograph. And the concept behind this, I don't want to go into too much detail on it, but the idea is to have a really coarsely ruled grating. So instead of having, say, 1,200 rulings per millimeter, these gratings would have 100 or even less, 50, sometimes as low as 15 rulings per millimeter. That means that they're very, very coarsely ruled. You think, well, those are good only out in the, the far infrared or something. But it turns out that you can use these coarsely ruled gratings in high orders to get very, very high resolution. He also invented a thing called the automatic comparator. Again, I'm going to pick on Bonner, and I'll pick on Alex Sheline as well, who's in the audience. They remember this thing. This was the invention, as I said, of George Harrison. It's the automatic comparator, or sometimes called the densitometer microphotometer. I wish uh, Professor Raymond Barnes were in the audience because he made all of us suffer by <laughs> working on one of these things. It's a way of scanning a photographic plate. Ordinarily, in these old-fashioned spectrographs, what was done is that a photographic plate, sometimes a photographic film, was used to, re used to record the spectrum. Really a great method for simultaneous measurement. The problem is it was nonlinear. The problem is you can't measure the intensity by holding the plate up to the, to the light. So this device called a densitometer, microphotometer, was developed for that purpose by, by Harrison. And we, when we were graduate students, had to hang over this thing and measure these, uh, these spectra scanning across the lines. And some of us even managed to expose entire boxes of the plates. It's quite... <laughs> 
Uh, I mentioned that I would indicate a, a couple of, of uh, references here. This is by the, uh, the book that um, Dennis Peters first of all mentioned, The History of Analytical Chemistry. And they said at that time, 1977, mind you, there is presently little indication that a shell spectrometers will soon be popular. Bonner, what do you think about that? <laughs> Actually, a shell spectrometers, cross-dispersed shell spectrometers, are now used in virtually every atomic emission spectrometer, whether it uses an ICP or, or not. So it's a very, very important device. Not everyone can be right all the time. Another person involved in gratings was uh, Robert Wood. Uh, Robert W. Wood, very, very famous fellow in, uh, in fluorescence spectroscopy as well, was again at John, Johns Hopkins in the physics department. He invented and designed what are called blaze gratings. And basically the blaze gratings, if you look at the bottom here, have an angle on them. That is, it's not just a periodic ruling, but rather there's an angle on the face. And that means that the preferred direction of light that bounces off the grating goes in a specific direction. And that means that most of the light can go into a desired order at a desired wavelength. And by order, I'm talking about the different orders of interference. And what that means is that the grating can be far, far more efficient. So that really made a big difference. He was also involved in other things, as I said. He was the first to photograph ultraviolet-induced fluorescence. He also was the first, uh, or one of the first at least, to observe atomic fluorescence in an efficient way. And the first one to observe field emission, which of course, Graham indicated is, in is important in mass spectrometry. The holographic grading was not developed in America. I apologize for that. But it's actually a, a later development, one that's extremely important in spectrochemical analysis. And the nice thing about it is that unlike in the original ruling engines developed by, by uh, uh, the, uh, the fellows I mentioned before. In this case, light actually does the work for us. And the ruling engines, it was really a mechanical process. That is, a, uh, a, the ruling engine moved a, a little stylus down the surface of, say, a, an aluminum surface. And what that would do is sort of plow a groove in it. And then another groove would be plowed next to it and so on. And of course, periodic errors would creep in there and junk would pile up from the, the plowing process. And that meant that the gratings were far from, from ideal. As a result, scattered light became really a serious problem, making Raman spectroscopy very, very difficult. And then along came uh, people from Michaud Yvon in 1967, and they said, if we have two laser beams coming in from the same laser, so they're coherent, they'll produce an interference pattern such as we see here. That interference pattern will be bright and dim and bright and dim, so we can then have a photoresist, a photosensitive layer as it's labeled here, a photoresist that is exposed alternately in a periodic fashion. So this is the pattern that's actually produced when the photoresist is developed. That means that the, the rulings are perfectly, uh, really ideal, except that they don't have a blaze. To get a blaze, and the, they have to then do some ion etching afterward. But the important thing is that this allows the elimination of these periodic errors and the so-called ghost development. Ghosts look like Raman lines. That is, they're satellites on a particular line. It also is, of course, a much lower cost operation. The difference is pretty apparent here. In this case, what we have is a log scale on the vertical axis, and this is one particular wavelength that is being uh, dispersed, one particular frequency, if you wish, that's dispersed by both a ruled grating and a holographic grating. And look at how much the, back, the background is reduced in the holographic grating. So a very, very important development in gratings. Another one that's very important in order to reduce the cost of gratings and to make commercial spectrometers much more attractive is this whole business of grating replication. Whether we start with a ruled grating, mechanically ruled grating, or a holographically ruled grating, if each one has to be made separately, it's a bit really expensive and time-consuming process. But this method for grating replication was developed in the 1940s by Fraser and White from Perkin Elmer. Cost about one-tenth the, uh, the price of the original grating, but the performance was the same. Really clever, basically whether they started with a holographic or a mechanically ruled grating, all they did was to put a release agent, releasing agent on the surface here. They would then deposit a top layer of aluminum, if that's the material they wanted to use for the grating. And of course, what we see is a mirror image of the top surface to the bottom surface. We then pull the two apart, and we have a new grating that's exactly the mirror image of the first one. Now, one of the nice things about that is not just the, the reduced cost, but also that a company, Perkin Elmer or whoever it happens to be, Agilent, can have one master grading that they own. They can then make many, many replicas from it, and they know that every one of those replicas will be exactly the same as the others. So it makes the spectrometer manufacturer, ma manufacturer much, uh, much more reproducible. Optrodes. Again, Thomas Hirschfeld is going to come in here. Here's one of his statements taken from the 1979 um, 
uh, summer symposium on analytical chemistry on the topic of, of lasers uh, at, held at uh, Purdue University. Uh, that's in northern Indiana, I believe. That's supposed to be a joke, Graham. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thomas said, there's always a need for doing analysis at a place where you are not. For example, when your sample happens to be a chemical warfare agent, local analysis methods would tell you you're dead. <laughs> that is actually a statement he made at that, uh, that summer symposium. Uh, the idea here is that um, fiber optic sensors, whether they have a sensing vehicle or not, really offers a lot of uh, benefits. Just the, uh, the fact that we have light rather than electrical signal means that we have relative immunity to electrical noise. The thing can be miniaturized very, very e easily, safer and rapid. Uh, again, at the, at the possible expense of not getting through the, the whole talk, I'll tell you another anecdote. Thomas Hirschfeld, when he was at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, decided that uh, he would have to use fiber optics for a particular project. And that project uh, was long ago declassified. The important thing is that they were trying to look at nuclear explosions far underground. The problem is the shock wave from the nuclear explosion went even faster than an electrical signal up a coaxial cable. So you'd have a, a sensing vehicle down where the bomb goes off, and of course the bomb would eat up your wire before the signal got to the top. But the light traveled faster in the optical fiber, so he solved that problem. A lot of other applications, of course, besides bomb monitoring, there is chemical warfare agent detection, medical monitoring, industrial and chemical processes, and so on. NMR and magnetic resonance imaging are, of course, mostly American developments and extremely, extremely important. Or I shouldn't say mostly American, somewhat American developments. Just before the founding of the analytical division, Robbie described Larmor resonance uh, in a lithium chloride beam. For that, he won the 1944 Nobel Prize. In 1945 and 1946, uh, uh, Block and Purcell, Stanford and Harvard respectively, um, developed uh, NMR, observed, they observed NMR, and in 1952 they shared the Nobel Prize. And in 1948 uh, the NMR patent was licensed to, to Varian. And of course there's magnetic resonance imaging. These are really interesting guys. Felix Block did his studies at ETH in Zurich. He took courses from Dubai and from Schrodinger. He did his PhD in Leipzig with Heisenberg. His later work with Fer was with Fermi, Bohr, Pauli. What a CV, just incredible. But he left Germany in 1933 because he was opposed to the, uh, the Nazi regime. He then went to Stanford and did his NMR work there. Edward Purcell got his double E at Purdue. Did you know that, Graham? Yeah. I I'm not surprised. <laughs> he got his PhD in Harvard in 1938. He worked in radar uh, in World War II um, at MIT. And he did, his M he did his NMR studies at Harvard. And of course, the, uh, one of the more recent developments is magnetic resonance imaging. That received the Nobel Prize in 2003 by, by uh, Paul Lauterbur, who died not too long ago, and Peter Mansfield, two uh, tremendous scientists. Then in the topic near and dear to my heart, one of the winners here, ICP atomic emission spectrometry and ICP mass spectrometry. And again, I have to have a little quote in here. This is in 1968, keep that, that year in mind, 1968. This fellow, Marvin Margosius, who's still around and still cantankerous and still argues with all of us, published a paper with one of his, uh, his colleagues, Claude Vion, who worked for Jim Weinfordner. And this paper that is, as we see in Spectrochemica Octa Part B, you can see it at the bottom, entitled An Evaluation of the Induction Coupled Radio Frequency Plasma Storage. Sounds like ICP, doesn't it? For atomic emission and atomic absorption spectrometry, they say, except for a few refractory elements, the 4.8 megahertz plasma torch, that's frequency is actually important as I'll indicate, does not appear to be a suitable replacement for chemical flame. Eh, not so much. <laughs> However, a controversy even before that time developed. As I said, this paper was in 1968, but there were two fellows who had been working on ICPs for quite some time, and the question is who deserves more of the credit? Velmer Fassel from Iowa State University or Stan Greenfield who worked for an industrial firm named Albright and Wilson in the United Kingdom. And they both had some things right and some things wrong. Greenfield actually started earlier and he actually got a patent on the, uh, on the ICP, as you can see down here, in 1963. Stan said, you should have a tangential flow of cooling gas in the torch. And he proved that that was really pretty important. In contrast, Velmer Fassel had a laminar flow torch, which didn't, didn't work quite so well. Stan Greenfield also said we need a toroidal plasma, that one that, that has a hole in the center into which we can inject aerosol. And Velmer Fassel didn't have quite that. In fact, that was the thing that, that killed 
Claude Villon and Marvin Margotius was that they didn't have a hole in the center of the plasma. They had a low frequency plasma and that produces kind of a fireball rather than a donut shaped plasma. Stan's big mistake was that he used a nitrogen supported ICP at 20 kilowatts. You can feed whole cattle into this thing at 20 kilowatts. <laughs> In contrast, Velmer Fassel realized that he needed a gas that would ionize more readily, didn't have rotational and, and uh, uh, vibrational fine structure, and as a result, he could operate it at 1.5 kilowatts. So there really was a, a contribution from both of them. The big thing that Velmer Fassel did, in my opinion, is that Velmer Fassel applied the, the ICP to a broad range of problems and really made it quite useful for the average uh, user. Atomic mass spectrometry. I said I won't talk about mass spec, but I have to have a little bit in there because it's kind of a complement to uh, ICP inductively uh, atomic emission spectrometry. And this has a long and interesting history also, all of which took place really since 19, well after 1938. In the 1950s and early 60s, uh, Sugden and a bunch of other people at Shell Research in the United Kingdom worked on flames, trying to understand flames better. In fact, uh, mass spectrometry is still widely used to study combustion processes. In 1973, really early on, Alcamata, the same fellow I showed you before, suggested that flame mass spectrometry be used for analysis. Uh, he didn't get involved in it, it was just a suggestion at a conference. 1974 to 1975, Alan Gray, the guy in the center down here, uh, suggested that flames and uh, different kinds of discharges be used for mass spectrometry, and he published several papers on that. And then in 1980 and, 19, uh, 1980 and 81, ICP mass spectrometry really was published as an entity in itself by Sam Hulk from Iowa State University, who's a grad student for Velmer Fassel. Uh, Alan Gray again was involved, and Alan Date from, uh, from the United Kingdom as well. And here's the really amazing thing to me. About two years later, two and a half years later, the first commercial instrument came out, a quadrupole mass spectrometer, a t uh, ICP mass spectrometer by SIAX, and also by VG. SIAX was a Canadian company, and VG is a British company. For some reason, even though the developments took place in America, we were a bit slow to take advantage of it. Charge transfer array detectors. Uh, this is a topic I know that, again, Bonner is going to be very happy to hear about. Charge transfer array detectors really had quite a long development. Uh, there were a bunch of, of TV-type detectors. Again, Marvin Margotius was involved in, in some of that. TV detectors used in place of the photographic plate or in place of single-channel detectors. And then a bunch of Individual linear detector arrays came out by Reticon, General Electric, SIDTEC, Fairchild, a bunch of companies came out with, with first of all, one-dimensional, that is linear arrays, and then two-dimensional arrays later on. Mike Franklin, who was at the University of Missouri at that time, Gary Horlick at the University of Alberta, and some other people who use these linear, linear arrays for, for emission spectrometry. But I think the real pioneer in this, er in this area, I think uh, everyone would uh, agree, is, is Bonner Denton from Arizona. Bonner and some other people uh, started using two-dimensional arrays and showed how useful they can be. With this thing I talked about before, the shell spectrometer, we can have high resolution dispersion on one axis and low resolution dispersion in the other axis and really take advantage of a, of a two-dimensional detector. And that led to a whole bunch of different commercial instruments that involve ICP atomic emission spectrometry, Raman spectrometers have one or two-dimensional dispersions, fluorescence spectrometers, and so on. The discovery and exploitation of the IR region is, is really kind of an interesting story, I think. Uh, Koblenz, William Koblenz, was at NBS, uh, now NIST, of course, from uh, 1905 to 1945, and he designed the first PRISM spectrometer. Um, again, boy, I'm going to run out of time, and I can't help but tell you these anecdotes. I'll pick on Purdue one more time, but a really, really brilliant guy there named John Amy told me a story about a PRISM spectrometer that they had in their undergraduate lab. As all the academicians in the audience know, during the summer, our instruments sit idle. And as, the, uh, as a result of all that, when the fall semester comes out or comes around, we have to tune the instruments up again. And John said he went into the, the undergraduate teaching laboratory and tried working on this old prism-based infrared spectrometer and had just a devil of a time. He couldn't get any resolution to speak of. And then he opened up the box to see what, it, what might, in fact, be wrong with the optics. Well, the prisms, of course, in an IR spectrometer have to be transparent to IR radiation. Therefore, they're made of different salt materials, and this is just a sodium chloride prism. And it turns out that a nest of mice had gone in there, and they're using the prism as a salt lick. <laughs> a lot of people work to, uh, to go to longer and longer wavelengths, and uh, uh, 
Functional group bands were important also uh, by, by Koblenz. Uh, let's see, there we go. Another thing that was really important was uh, the work by, uh, by Norman Colthup in, uh, at American Cyanamid. Um, he still, um, he, he, was, he died just a few years ago as you can see. He came up with this group frequency chart that we're all familiar with. And about at the same time, the first commercial instruments uh, in the infrared came out. The first one was never commercialized. The Beckman IR-1 instrument was developed in World War II in 1942 and it was not allowed to be commercialized because it was used for the war effort. In fact, to measure the concentration of polybutadiene, which of course was the, the basis for synthetic rubber in World War II. The first, commer first commercial instrument was actually the Beckman Model uh, 12, which came out a couple of years later. Other developments in the, in the IR region, this is again something that predates the time period we're talking about that starts in 1938, but Mike Michelson came up with the Michelson Interferometer course. He happened to be at the Naval Academy, did most of his work at Case, he was at Clark University and the University of Chicago. He won the first uh, American Nobel Prize in Physics in 1907, but he developed this interferometer that we're all used to seeing now in Fourier transform IR spectrometers. However, at that time it was necessary to calculate the Fourier transform in a laborious fashion by hand. The, comp uh, the computers just weren't available at that time to enable the, the Fourier transform to be performed in a rapid fashion. In addition, this algorithm by James Cooley and John Tukey was not yet available. That was in 1965. They had this fast Fourier transform algorithm that enabled the Fourier transform to be calculated with blinding speed. In your hand calculator, if you have one now, you can probably push a button and get a fast Fourier transform. And this led indirectly to the first commercial uh, Fourier transform IR instrument. It was a Digilab FTS-14. Here's a photograph of it. Oops, sorry. A photograph of that. And again, our friend Thomas Hirschfeld came into play. Thomas Hirschfeld worked for Block Engineering. Block Engineering designed this Digilab spectrometer. And another fellow I mentioned before, Gary Horlick, went to work for Block Engineering during a summer, which is how Gary got involved in Fourier transform spectrometry. Okay, the last topic on our list here is near IR correlation spectrometry. And here's a method that shouldn't work. If we look at the near-infrared region, we realize the near-infrared region, as uh, indicated by Wilbur Kay and Beckman from 1954 to 55, he said the near-infrared region consists of bands that are combination bands of fundamental vibrations, overtones of fundamental vibrations, and these things are all dependent very strongly on a molecule's environment. So the, the, the environment changes the bands. Therefore, the method is no good for, for analytical use. However, along comes Carl Norris, who worked at the USDA laboratory from 1961 to 64. And Carl Norris said, well, all we really need is high signal-to-noise ratio. It's, it's kind of like multi-component spectrophotometry. We have two unknowns. We use two wavelengths. We have two equations, two unknowns. We can solve it. But here we have an unknown number of constituents, so we just use a bunch of wavelengths and do it all by means of a correlation algorithm. And he's, he found, for example, that he could apply this to grains, start out with Farmer Brown's um, grains, grind the grains up, find out what the protein concentration is by means of Kieldahl. Does anyone know what the Kieldahl method is? How many people have done Kieldahl methods? Ah, oh, you poor devils. <laughs> I, I too have done Kieldahl determinations. They are no fun, but you determine the nitrogen, of course, from, from the, the Kieldahl and calculate the protein. You can also get oil by other methods and water by other methods, and this is done for a whole bunch of Farmer Brown samples. The next time Farmer Brown comes in, you've done the correlation you put the, uh, the uh, samples into the near-infrared spectrometer, and the spectrometer, or the, really the computer, has learned to correlate the concentration of these constituents with the spectrum, and it tells you what then the concentration of the constituents in the new sample happen to be. Works like a chime, and it's used now widely in the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of other, other areas. Well, this is now a listing. My time is nearly up, I see. This is a listing that I started with. I'm not going to go through any more. My time, as I said, is about up. but. I think I should probably predict something. For, no, never mind. <laughs> I've done this before. Some of you in the audience will remember this publication. This is one of my publications in 1989. I was asked um, at a conference to deliver a talk on atomic absorption spectrometry. Has it gone or where is it going? So I first started with this list of publications, or the, really this time-dependent publication list, for atomic absorption spectrometry, and being quantitatively oriented, almost a physical chemist sometimes, I was tempted to fit a third order polynomial to that. <laughs> and we see that the third order polynomial goes to zero by the year 2000. 
So naturally, I predicted that atomic absorption would die by the year 2000. Some people took me seriously, and I have caught more grief for that publication <laughs> than any other publication I've, I've ever given. But let's just look over the horizon, not just spectrochemistry, but let's look at analytical chemistry over the horizon and see just what things might exist in the future. How about whole body mass spectrometry, Graham? What do you think about that? Can we do that? There we go, whole body ma <laughs> mass spectrometry. Or we had, we had Bill talking about um, electrochemistry. Electrochemists have used almost every permutation of current voltage and time. Isn't that right? Almost everyone. But here's one that you haven't tried. Linear ramp chrono jump coulometry. <laughs> the idea of this is that you, you run your electrode up to the speed of light, at which time time goes to zero, current goes to infinity, and your sensitivity is wonderful. <laughs> Add a second IR spectroscopy. Think about that for a few minutes. Uh. <laughs> and finally, GC by GC by GC. <laughs> this is for Milos. Well, it's been a delight being here. Thank you, Dennis, for asking me. Uh, I really enjoyed this tremendously. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs>